Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, it is 11 a.m. and we're calling the Texas Early Learning Council meeting to order. I'm Reagan Miller. I'm the chair of the Early Learning Council and also with the Texas Workforce Commission over the Child Care and Early Learning Division. Um, so I want to welcome all of the council members. Happy 2024. Um, and of course, to all of the guests that are um, that are attending with us today as well. Um, so as you all know, this is a Zoom meeting. Council members, presenters, and agency staff are participating as panelists. Um, members of the public are able to participate in a listen-only mode. Um, as a reminder to our members, presenters, and agency staff, keep your electronic devices on mute when you're not speaking, and Megan will help mute us if we forget. Um, Megan is our interagency deputy director for early childhood support, and she is going to facilitate today's meeting. Um, also a reminder to members, try to remember to state your name uh, before you speak. The um, opportunity to submit public comment, written public comment closed yesterday at 5 p.m. Members of the public are still able to request um, to provide oral public comment today by emailing their request to Megan Schneider. And Megan is going to put instructions into the chat um, if any members of the public are interested. All right, so that's gonna take us to our next agenda item and that is um, the October 2023 meeting minutes. You guys received a copy of that in an email from Megan. Um, it's, it was also in your meeting invitation. So I wanted to see if anybody had any edits or changes to the October 2023 meeting minutes. And if not, I'd like to request a motion to approve the October 2023 meeting minutes. This is Kathy. Uh, oh, go ahead. I move to approve the minutes. All right, a motion would, was made by Catherine Abba. Do I have a second? I second it. This is Terry Breeden. All right, Terry, thank you very much for seconding. Um, pending any discussion, Megan will take a roll call vote um, of the council members. Megan, over to you. Great, thanks, Reagan. Um, when I call your name, please reply for, against, or abstain. And as a reminder, even if you weren't present at the last set of um, at the last um, meeting, you're able to still approve the minutes if you'd like. Catherine Abba, four. Sarah Abrahams, four. Weldon Beard. Terry Breeden. Four. April Crawford. Four. Rochelle Daniel. Four. Alferma Giles. Four. Melissa Hoisington. Becky Huskeeler. Four. Kim Coffrin. Four. Tori Lee. Couldn't tell if I heard someone there. Um, Beatrice Mata. Four. Reagan Miller. Four. Maricela Nava. Four. Four. Stephanie Rubin. Four. Amber Scanlon. Four. Kirsten Schwab. Four. Jennifer Stockmer. Four. June Yateman. Four. Megan Young. Four. All right, the motion to approve the October 2023 meeting minutes has carried, um, and we met a quorum as well um, as we approved the minutes. I'll turn it back over to you, Reagan. All right, thank you. Um, our next agenda item is public comment. Megan, did we have anybody who signed up today for public comment? We did not have anyone in advance. Um, and I also didn't receive any just from the beginning couple minutes of the meeting. So as a reminder, um, there is always this agenda item of public comment that's open. So you just have to email me um, in advance and each speaker gets three minutes to give public comment about any of the agenda items that are posted 
which are all posted on earlylearningtexas.org. I'll pass it back to you, Reagan. Hey, thank you, Megan. Okay, um, our next agenda item is the Preschool Development Grant Birth Through Five. Um, as you all know, Texas was awarded the PDG B5 grant. It's a three-year grant, and we're receiving $16 million in each of those three years. Um, TWC is serving as the lead agency, but we're doing this on behalf of all of our interagency early childhood partners. So all of the agencies are engaged in activities um, that support uh, the plan's goals. And you guys have also been actively involved, so I want to thank all of you for all of the work that you did and all of the meetings that we had to review information, both on the needs assessment and on the strategic plan. So you received a copy of both of those in your meeting materials. Um, for members of the public, Megan, we are still going through some accessibility um, remediation on the reports. As soon as those accessibility issues are addressed, we will be posting these reports, but we don't post them until they're fully accessible. So we've got a little bit of work left to do there. Um, so again, thank you to all of the council members for all of the work in doing this. I'm going to turn it over to Megan because she's going to walk us through uh, the Texas Early Learning Plan the Texas Early Learning Strategic Plan um, and the, the goals and strategies included in this. So make it. Great, thank you, Reagan. Uh, we are ping-ponging this whole meeting so far back and forth. Uh, I'm excited, just wanna echo Reagan's excitement about unveiling this plan. Uh, council members, none of this is new to y'all. You've been in the weeds with us over the course of 2023, helping to put this together, but excited to share it uh, with the broader public, of course. So uh, Cindy, if you wanna take us to the next slide, uh, just as a reminder to set some context, like Reagan mentioned, we as a council have had a early learning strategic plan that was established back in 2019 through initial preschool development grant funding. And we've had the chance now with preschool development grant dollars uh, to use conduct a new statewide needs assessment that then informs a new statewide strategic plan um, and so that covers starting this calendar year, 2024 through 2026 is kind of the time span for it. It is jointly owned. Um, if you wanna go back to that last slide for me, Cindy, it is jointly owned by all of y'all, uh, the council members, and it was expertly facilitated through the whole process of crafting this plan by the team at the University of Texas Center for Child and Family Wellbeing. So just want to give um, a special kudos to Kate McCurley, Beth Gerlach, Nicole Trevino, and their team who helped, helped navigate us through this whole process over the course of 2023. So you can go to the next slide. When we talk about the Texas Early Learning System, these are just the different state and system entities that we're thinking of. So the different agencies, state agencies that own early learning services and programs or that, that help run early learning services and programs, as well as the Texas Head Start State Collaboration Office, uh, which is not its own agency, but uh, also a state entity. And then those two groups on the far right that don't oversee any programs directly, which of course is us, you all, the Texas Early Learning Council, uh, as well as the Early Childhood Interagency Work Group, which is a group of uh, those different state agencies who I helped to convene. So if you want to go to the next slide, y'all um, already know all the hard work that you put into this over the course of the last year, but want to make sure that everyone understands the process that we undertook. Um, so for those of you who tuned in throughout, we, of course, were hearing from Dr. Dorothy Mandel over the course of 2023 as she was sharing updates um, and pieces of the, street, or sorry, of the statewide needs assessment as they were becoming available. Those fed into three strategic planning sessions that y'all did as a council. One was virtual, two were in person. And there were three main inputs to the plan itself, um, which are those next three bullets on the slide. So the UT team that was facilitating this process really did a lot of work to actively engage with family who received state services as well as early learning workforce stakeholders. 
um, and collect their thoughts through interviews, focus groups, various different mechanisms that they fed to the council to help guide the different discussions we had over those three planning sessions. There was also consideration, of course, of the statewide needs assessment as it was becoming available um, in the different phases. And then lastly, the UT team did a content scan of all the other current early learning state entity strategic plans. So everyone you saw listed in that table, um, all the different agencies that have, for example, the TEA strategic plan, Texas Workforce Commission's child care and education, uh, sorry, child care and early learning state plan, et cetera, did a scan of all of those so that we weren't starting completely from scratch, um, but building off of all the work that's already happening and, and being promised. So um, as part of that plan refresh that we've gotten to do, it really started with the core, which is what is the vision? What is the early learning vision um, for our state? We were able to revisit, um, revisit what we had previously and flush it out a bit more. So this is the new vision, uh, which is that all young Texans have a strong foundation for success. And then uh, to be a bit more granular, that every young child in Texas has the resources to build resiliency, adaptability, and autonomy to succeed. And then we approached um, how, how to reach that vision. We broke down into different goals, different kind of things that have to happen to layer in. So if you look at that little pyramid there on the right, uh, the child would be at the top, right? Um, every young child in Texas has that opportunity. And we see parents and caregivers as that kind of next layer closest to the child. From there would be families and families being able to reach and obtain their basic needs with the different early learning services programs and resources and being meaningfully engaged in that program development. And then from there are communities um, as well as the workforce and strong local collaborations. So having those different pieces in place that, um, that the workforce is paid, trained and supported and that there are enough workforce members to meet community needs. And then broader than uh, individual workforce members, but those strong local collaborations between both local and state early learning services to help support and engage families and children. And then um, at the bottom, that kind of biggest zoomed out view is the state early learning system entities and the, and the level of collaboration needed to make family and data informed decisions to improve those services, programs and resources. So we see all of that building on um, itself and being interrelated. Um, and from those different um, pieces that need to be in place is where all of the goals come. So around um, the, the whole plan is centered around these four main goals. And you'll see those same threads of family, workforce, local systems, and kind of broader state systems through that integrated data and system level. So the first goal, um, like I mentioned, is that families can, it is centered around family access, navigation, and engagement. So the vision that families can easily meet their basic needs and access the early learning services, programs, and resources they need, and that they're meaningfully engaged. The second goal is focused on the workforce, specifically recruitment, retention, and support. So being well-paid, trained, and supported, and being able to reach and obtain the professional development resources that the workforce needs throughout their careers, and that there are enough of them. It's a large enough workforce to meet Texas's needs. The third goal is focused around the systems, the local systems, so partnership and systems building, that they're well-coordinated, have enough resources, and are able to successfully support kids and their families in their communities. And then that last goal is focused on integrated data and system level work so that state early learning system entities are collaborating to make those family and data informed decisions in order to improve services, programs, and resources for children and their families. So some exciting lofty goals um, that we're excited to anchor the work around and then I'll do a quick walkthrough of the different strategies that show up in those four goals um, without just reading these slides back to you. Um, but, but know that when you see the full plan, so council members, you have that, members of the public, we will have it posted very soon, we hope. Within each goal, there is a set of strategies, which is what we'll walk through now. And then each strategy is further broken down with specific actions to take as well as measures of success. So each of these strategies 
everything you're seeing on these slides is still fairly high level. And then in the, in the plan itself, we are able to get a bit more granular. Who's doing what and how are we holding ourselves accountable for those different actions? So within the family navigation access and engagement um, bucket are four strategies. So the first is focused around streamlining intake and, administrat and administrative systems for both parents and providers so that it's easier to navigate our early learning programs and services. The second is around availability and supply. So having more, um, more supply of early learning programs and services themselves. And the third goes hand in hand with that, which is access. So having more available as well as increasing access to those early learning programs and services. And then the fourth is around um, the, the feedback loops. So increasing family feedback in order to improve the quality and accessibility of early learning services, putting their voices um, kind of front and center in, in how, we're, how we're designing those programs. So the next goal around workforce recruitment also has four main strategies, and those are focused around increasing financial support of the early learning workforce, as well as kind of clarifying or expanding and refining what are the pathways to include all professionals who work with young children, um, and expanding the number of people entering the early learning workforce. So this gets at that retention or sorry, that recruitment piece. And then the last strategy 2.4 focused on retention. So once people are in that early learning workforce, um, how do we make sure that we're retaining them? And of course, all of these different strategies within any of these different goals play off of each other and uh, help complement and support each other. So the third um, just has one main strategy which is um, around local systems and partnerships. So that's to provide educational and informational support to local partnerships to help communities make informed decisions. So we have lots of rich data coming out of our needs assessment about the landscape of early childhood coalitions across the state. So being able to now take that and figure out what are, what are the gaps and what are the shining spots um, that we can help lift up and provide more intentional resources. And then lastly, around data and system coordination, there's three strategies here. The first is to develop an early childhood integrated data system so that we're able to better, to better share data across our agencies to inform our state level policy and program improvement. Um, for those of you who have been following along to these meetings, you've heard lots of discussion about early childhood integrated data systems, and you know that we have a statewide roadmap. Um, so, this goal is really around picking up that roadmap and starting to build things out as recommended in that plan. The second strategy is to support the use of that data um, by communities and stakeholders uh, using data platforms so that they're able to inform their own local quality improvement actions and systems planning. And then the last is around general alignment and coordination across our agencies to improve family access, navigation, and engagement. So, how are we coordinating our systems and how are we using the data available to us even now and over the longer term as we have more of an integrated data system in place to inform and improve um, what we're doing. So in terms of next steps, um, just logistically, as Reagan mentioned, um, the full strategic plan will be posted both on the Texas Early Learning Council website as well as TWC's public preschool development grant birth through five page very soon, we're hoping within the next couple of weeks. And then we will be using these Texas Early Learning Council quarterly meetings as a space to really anchor around the plan and report out on progress of, around those different strategies, actions, and measures of success. And then if you want more detail, because this was a pretty, pretty high level overview um, of the strategic plan, and we didn't dig into the details of the needs assessment, we will be going into more detail on both in our first um, public PDGB5 quarterly webinar, which is in early March, March 6th. We'll drop the link for how to register for that in the chat here, but would definitely welcome you. We'll have Dr. Mandel there to dig more into the needs assessment as a whole, um, as well as walk through more of the details and that action and measure of success level within the strategic plan. So I will be happy to answer questions or you know hear feedback 
again, none of this is a surprise to you all as council members, um, but hopefully it feels good to see it all pulled together and, you know, in a, in a single package. Stephanie. Yeah. Um, well, th I mean, obviously, thanks to everybody for participating, uh, not just council members, of course, but there was a lot of engagement at the local level and in communities to give feedback. Um, the last couple of meetings we have had as a council have been, you know, you know, kudos to the UT team for facilitating some great meetings with lots of, you know, paper on the wall and lots of input and reading. I, you know, I just want to just for process sake, the document that um, will be posted is not something that the council has reviewed itself before now, you know, we've given input and have wordsmithed some things on, you know, paper on the wall and made suggestions, but um, the document itself as it's laid out and the vision and the actions and the, uh, the, the strategies and the actions, those are things that we're reading, I think, largely for the first time as a semi-final document. So I just wanted people, as they see it later, to know that we, you know, we, we um, this is the first time we're seeing it too as of this meeting. So, um, and then the last thing I wanted to say, just in terms of like how far we've come, is um, I was remembering today that you know, this iteration of the Early Learning Council, I think began, Reagan, if I'm correct, in 2019. And there were earlier Early Learning Councils, of course, with prior grants, but that's, uh, you know, that's uh, been a good amount of time that we've been working together, most of us working together through, now this is a, we, our second needs assessment and our second plan. And I think um, this one looks and feels uh, much more cohesive and cross, you know, collaborative, I think. And also, um, uh, you know, we'll see with the action steps that there are, um, there will be some continuation of action steps that have already been happening over the last couple of years where the state, you know, really jumped in and provided resources, whether they're federal or state, you know, to communities that needed them. So I think that's, uh, you know, we've made progress and I think this will continue it. I, I know one question people probably have, um, and this I think, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Megan, we'll talk about next time is the action steps are over what period of years, um, whether it's the, the life of the grant or beyond that. So I don't know if that's something you just want to address now or wait till the next conversation. You know, are yeah. we talking about 20 years of steps? Or are we talking about two years of steps? Um, because as la as we discussed last time, you know, we are trying to set a bold vision, which I think this does. And then the action steps are a variety of things that continue progress that's been made, uh, move towards some new direction. But I, you know, we're not, um, we're not trying to hold the legislature and agencies to steps over a 20 year, you know, period in that kind of transformational way. That was really not our charge, um, if I understand it correctly. Yeah, thanks for clarifying. And I think um, it's a great point. So this really is focused, the strategic plan, similar to its predecessor, is focused on a specific time horizon. So it's focused on <clears throat> calendar year 2024 through 2026. And that's really with an eye partly towards um, the scope of the grant itself. Um, which runs through 2025. Um, so thinking about um, thinking about that as the time horizon. And then I do want to clarify um, your point about the the document and you know how often y'all got to review it. There was an opportunity to see all council members saw it twice, right? We did two rounds of feedback as we were as it was coming together. So definitely folks on the council saw it as it was coming together, you know, jumped in, gave specific, like, I think this person should right, do this right. instead, et cetera. Yeah, so, as, a, as a cohesive piece, or, you know, pulled together in this way with the action steps. It, it looks great. I just wanted, um, I and maybe I just didn't uh, see it in this form or read it in this form on the last time. But, um, but I just, you know, wanted, um, and it wasn't there. Anyway, I just wanted to clarify that, at least for my, from my review, um, this pulled together is um, 
It looks great. I just wanted to talk about the process itself. Like there was a lot of feedback on all the different pieces, but as one large document, unless I'm incorrect. It didn't um, change drastically from the last okay. round when, when council members saw it, but um, okay. very fair that there were lots of different um, spots and, you know, places that y'all saw it come together. So Okay. And as we talk about actionable steps and making clarifying, yeah, we are talking about over the next three years, what are the things that we can actually accomplish? Right. And that's what this plan was really focused on. And as Megan said, we're going to use our quarterly early learning council meetings as an opportunity to report out. One of the, well, I think one of the key pieces that we heard back a lot of input on was how do we keep up with progress in all of the strategies, Megan, strategies, action items, measurable outcomes. I'm not using all the right words, but how do we how do we keep up with all of the things that, that we laid out to see where we stand? And so we really do want to put a process in place um, that allows us to keep looking at each of these and where we stand. I think that was um, something that we didn't do with the first strategic plan and an area that we all agree we need to do a better job um, this time around of really keeping track of where we stand against these, these strategies and goals. And is that a continuation of the UT work or is that something the kind of early childhood, the, the early learning uh, collaborative agency group will do? I think that will be a joint effort across both the Texas Early Learning Council, so us, and then um, things that are owned by the different agencies of that are part of the early childhood interagency work group. Um, with with us um, working on those as an from an agency perspective, but there won't be continued um, support or work on the progress monitoring from the UT team specifically. Okay, thanks. Yeah, Becky. Yes, I noticed that even though Jerletha McDan McDon McDaniel or whatever she participated during the whole program and she was not listed on the participating council members and constituencies on page thirty eight, and I know that you that she rolled off of the early learning council, but that was right at the end, and except for the very last meeting where she her plane got delayed or whatever canceled she was here the whole time and so i think her name needs to be um included here because she did participate in all the different meetings that we had yeah it's such a great point becky and this was um we really chalk up just to the timing of when that rollover happened which we don't have any personal control over these are governor appointed spots we gave her a special specific shout out within the document um oh, right okay. under, at the in the introduction um following the list of council members to say also Julie McDonald you know was an amazing participant and member of yeah. the council for many years and throughout the process because you're exactly right she participated through all of the mm -hmm. 2023 sessions and then that council member rollover happened kind of right as uh, she rolled off Oh yeah, I see that right here. Yeah. I didn't I was just looked at the thing and didn't see that acknowledgement. I see that now on page one. Yeah, but thank you for raising it up because she she deserves um a special shout out for sure. All right, council members, any other thoughts, observations, or comments um on the PDG work? All right. Okay, then that is going to take us to our next agenda item. So as we're talking about quarterly updates, let's talk about our quarterly meeting schedule um, for 2024. So I'd like you guys uh, on, the, on this slide, you can see the proposed meeting dates and I hope you guys have had a chance to look at your calendars and see if there are any major um, conflicts with these suggested meeting dates. So April 5th, August 2nd, and October 18th. All right, I am not seeing anyone 
raise their hand. Thank you for the thumbs up, Kim. Okay, it sounds like these are pretty good. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, why don't you guys go ahead and pencil these in? Um, we will send out meeting mm -hmm. invitations through Outlook so you all have your, um, your calendars blocked. Um, and then Megan will post these on the Early Learning Council website for our upcoming meeting schedule. Um, so members of the public will have these as well. All right. Thanks everyone. Our next agenda item, we're gonna get some updates from um, Texas Early Learning Council members. We have four updates today. And the first update um, is from us, the Texas Workforce Commission. And Kathy Arwood is joining uh, to give an update on um, our CCDF state plan development. Thank you, Reagan, and good morning. Um, so TWC is currently developing the Child Care and Development Fund or CCDF state plan for Texas. And as we develop our state plan, we're seeking input from multiple stakeholders, including the Texas Early Learning Council, which serves as our state's advisory council on early childhood care and education. Uh, um, today, I wanna share some information about opportunities to provide input. Uh, um, but first I wanna share some background on what the CCDF CDF plan is um, to make sure we're all understanding that. Uh, um, so let's start by looking at the funding structure. CCDF is the funding from the federal program that provides child care and development block grants to states, tribes, and U.S. territories. It's administered um, at the federal level by the Office of Child Care, which is housed in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Administration for Children and Families. So that's a mouthful. The program's designed to promote family economic self-sufficiency and to help children succeed in school and life through affordable, high quality early child care and um, after school programs. So as the state's lead CCDF agency, TWC receives funding from the Office of Child Care to administer the child care subsidy and quality programs in Texas. And since Texas is a very large state, we pass funding down to the 28 local workforce development boards to actually administer the programs in their region. And the boards hire contractors and they implement the child care subsidy and Texas Rising Star programs in their areas. CCDF also requires the state to implement and oversee health and safety standards for child care operations. So a portion of CCDF funding goes to the Texas Health and Human Services Commission for child care regulation. And TWC also provides millions of dollars each year in CCDF funds um, to support quality initiatives across the state. So some that you might be familiar with would be um, professional development scholarships, registered apprenticeship programs, training opportunities um, in various ways in the infant toddler specialist network, uh, um, also shared services. So those are just a few of um, the different programs that we offer. So Know a little bit about what CCDF is, what is the state plan? Um, as with any federally funded program, we have to demonstrate that we are in compliance with the many federal rules and guidelines um, while we implement the program in Texas. The CCDF state plan lets the Office of Child Care know that um, like what we're doing and what we plan to do over the next three years. So the CCDF plan that we're working on now is for 2025 through 2027, and it's going to describe the policies, strategies, and vision for the child care services program, including the subsidy and um, Texas Rising Star. State plans divided into eight sections to describe how we define leadership and coordination with relevant systems and funding sources, promote family engagement through outreach and consumer education, provide stable child care financial assistance to families, ensure equal access for children and families with low income, establish standards and monitoring processes to ensure health and safety of child care settings, recruit and retain a qualified and effective child care workforce, support continuous quality improvement, and ensure our program integrity and accountability. 
Um, so now to the ways that, that you can provide some input. Um, this QR code will take you to the survey that we're asking all of our stakeholders to take. Uh, um, stakeholders that um, we're targeting in this, this survey would include parents, child care providers, local workforce development boards, employers interested in um, their, their employees' child care needs, and then other early childhood care and education stakeholders and advocates like many of you. Uh, um, and so I think Cindy has posted in the chat the link, uh, um, and please share that with other stakeholders that, um, that are within your purview. Uh, um, and so the survey's um, going to ask a um, ask about a range of topics, including uh, um, you know what you think about the policies and initiatives that would increase the availability of childcare, increase equal access to high quality childcare, and improve the quality of childcare. Uh, um, we're also going to ask your input on initiatives that TWC is considering in the 2025 to 2027 CCDF state plan based on previous feedback. And so these include Texas Rising Star, pre-K partnerships, child care for children with disabilities or special needs, statewide family child care network, business coaching, expansion, um, I'm sorry, capacity expansion, uh, um, employer-supported child care, work-based learning, staffing initiatives, and family engagement. So those are the topics that, that will be included, and we do look forward to hearing your feedback. Another opportunity, if you'll go ahead, yeah, thank you. Uh, um, in addition to the surveys is um, five in-person meetings that we're going to be holding throughout the state during February. Uh, um, these meetings offer opportunities to provide input on the state plan and the proposed updates. Um, we'll also share a little bit of feedback from um, the preliminary survey results. So you'll see uh, um, what we've learned there. And um, it's also gonna, going to uh, um, discuss the proposed updates to the Texas Rising Star program based on the Texas Rising Star four-year review work group recommendations. So that's a separate conversation, but um, these meetings will hold uh, um, opportunities for both of those. And so we'll be in Abilene on February 8th, Round Rock on the 13th, Houston on the 21st, McAllen on the 22nd, and Dallas on the 26th. So for those who would like to attend but are not able to make the in-person um, meetings, we, all, we are also offering a virtual meeting on February 28th. All of these meetings will be held at six o'clock and hosted by the Regions Workforce Board. Uh, um, they'll be held at either the local workforce solutions office or one of their community partners. So we're going to share more details on our web page that um, will show the, the specific details of um, where those will be held. And um, we'll have a survey for you to um, fill out to kind of RSVP and share any questions or comments that you have ahead of that. Uh, um, and I think we're going to post in the chat the the link to our webpage. Uh, um, and then, so I wanted to share a little bit about the timeline for the state plan. We are on a pretty tight timeline, uh, um, but you will have another opportunity to provide more specific input on the actual draft state plan during the public comment period. Uh, um, we expect to be holding a public hearing in either March or early April, and um, we'll share more information about that as we get closer. Uh, um, and I wanted to share also that we accept stakeholder written stakeholder input all year round. So um, the email address here, ccel at twc.texas.gov, uh, um, you can um, email us any specific input that you have at any time. That That is all for our update. Thank you. All right, Kathy, thank you. Let me see if council members have questions or comments. Right. Kathy, thank you very much. Um, our stakeholder page on our TWC website is not updated yet. It will be very soon. We're actually waiting for one additional 
meeting location. We have four of the five. We need to get the fifth, and then we're going to post it. So hopefully it will be up beginning of next week. We're just really close. We just don't want to post it without that fifth location. Um, we're also working on some background information. So if people get to the website and they don't know anything about the CCDF state plan, we're trying to do a quick one pager to really highlight, you know, what Kathy just went over with you. And then on the Texas Rising Star review process, then to also highlight the fact that we go through this review every four years, and we're going to include a summary and provide some links back to documents that are also being added to our website that um, summarize the input that we got from the work group. So we'll have a lot of information that we'll be adding to our stakeholder webpage uh, probably early next week. All right. Um, so our next um, council member update um, is from Megan Young with ECI. <laughs> Thanks, Reagan. All right. Um, so ECI held our um, advisory committee meeting yesterday, and I just wanted to highlight a few of our updates related to personnel development, since that's a big focus for us right now. And um, I think either Cindy or Megan will put a link in the chat to where you can view the meeting materials and the recording from the meeting if you want more info about anything I'm talking about right now. Um, so we have some upcoming per professional development webinars for our ECI direct service personnel including um, my team is really good at coming up with acronyms. So we have our series for meaningful interagency learning and education or our SMILE sessions. Um, this month we're, we're doing one on Texas home visiting, collaborations um, between ECI and the Prevention and Early Intervention, soon to be Family Support Services, which is Sarah Abraham's team. Um, and then next month we are gonna be covering Medicaid waiver programs to help support our providers in supporting families with accessing those uh, programs that could benefit those children. We're also resuming our genetics webinar series this month with a webinar um, titled Before, During, and After a Genetics Evaluation. Um, and then that has some continuing education credits for some of our UCI direct service professionals. And then um, we also are continuing our work. Our personnel retention grant from OSIP was renewed. We're now in year four. Um, our partners at the University of Texas at El Paso are doing some initial evaluation work with surveys um, to see, kind of gauge how successful they think some of our first three-year activities were. And we're working with our 11 subrecipients who will also receive some grant funding to implement evidence-based recruitment and retention strategies out in our local provider regions. And then another great acronym, our Professionalism Engagement Empowerment and Resource Network, or our Peer Network. Um, continues to grow. We have almost 400 members now. That's our early intervention specialist and service coordinators providing peer support on a virtual platform where they can connect someone in Beaumont with someone in El Paso to provide that support across. And they do a lot of peer learning together, which is really great. And then um, yesterday we held the third of our four Creating Connections conferences, which are funded um, through Texas Workforce Commission with some stimulus funding they received. Um, and these are these conferences facilitate the development of strong working relationships between our ECI providers and our early childhood care and education professionals with a focus on inclusive classrooms. Our last um, conference will be in El Paso next week on January 25th, and we'll get a link in the chat um, if anyone wants to register to attend that. We've had some really great feedback so far from the conference attendees. Um, and then also yesterday in the meeting, we discussed the ECI state office response to the unwinding of continuous Medicaid coverage, and um, we had a representative from the HHSC Eligibility Services Department to speak about the agency's, uh, the larger agency response outside of ECI specifics as well. Um, and we shared our annual performance metrics, which are very weedy, and I will not um, run through those with you today, but if you want to go look at that, we have the slides posted on our website, and you can watch the recording if you want to hear me go over those metrics in, in more detail. Any questions? Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much, Megan. Okay, our next update is from Sarah Abrahams at PEI. Hey, thank you. So uh, I'm Sarah Abrahams. I serve as the Deputy Associate Commissioner for Prevention and Early Intervention at the Department of Family Protective Services today because um, at part of what I want to just give an update about is our impending transition over to HHS. Um, so as, as most of you, I think, probably know, during the 88th legislative session, um, there was this clear intent to continue the state's investment in 
children and families, but specifically through Senate Bill 24 to transfer the functions of PEI, so prevention and early intervention, from the Department of Family and Protective Services to the Health and Human Services Commission. It did a couple of things, including renaming prevention and early intervention to family support services on that move. Um, modified some sections of our current statute and basically moved that statute and all the corresponding programs from DFPS to this newly created chapter in the Human Resource Code under the administration of HHSC. So that's a lot of very weedy work, but to say that the intent was basically to move all the things that were happening at PEI right now and move them to, um, to HHSC. Um, I I will say this is an enormous undertaking um, across agencies and departments spanning from program alignment to data sharing to IT coding to web design and rebranding. So it's a pretty um, comprehensive uh, transition. But I wanted to highlight some recent accomplishments that I think are probably most relevant in the day-to-day -to, -day to folks who are not um, in the spreadsheets of making sure that every staff member gets um, uncoded to one computer and recoded to another computer. I will say there has been this real guiding principle on the part of both agencies to minimize as much as possible any business disruption to grantees and community partners, and also to minimize any service disruption or potential service disruption to families. So with that kind of guiding principle in mind, I just wanna highlight that there has been agreement between the agencies that for our current grantees and our current grant agreements, that those, those current grant agreements will not end. They will transfer intact on September 1 from one agency to another with, um, and that, that essentially means for grantees that no one will have to reapply for their existing program or that their current grant cycle and their current grant cycle terms will remain intact. I, it was a, a, a very important milestone to hit and we're very pleased with that outcome and excited for our grantees to minimize that disruption. Um, two of the essential elements of the transition really revolve around data and IT, specifically around the use of our prevention and early intervention reporting system to collect and report data and to process and manage all of our budgets and payments. That is also a part of the minimizing business disruption. These transition projects are well underway um, with the goal of maintaining current levels of business operations and data access. And at this point in our project management spreadsheets, all things are green and we're very excited to be on track um, for that transition on the 9-1. In addition, and I just wanna highlight one other set of um, updates for PEI, which is in the past legislative session, PEI was also directed to expand opportunities to promote healthy families and build resilient communities um, through an appropriation of an additional over $65 million for the biennium, um, as well as some additional staff to the PEI division, really with the intent of allowing us to expand existing and established programming, and also to expand geographically the accessibility of that programming across the state. Um, that, that expansion or that additional appropriations focused on a handful of our PEI programs, which include the community youth development and family and youth success programs, but specific to early childhood, focus on our healthy outcomes through prevention and early support, which we call HOPES, the Texas Home Visiting Program, and the Nurse Family Partnership Program. Um, so I just want to give some highlights about where we are in that expansion. So our expansion plan, as I said, included both an intention to expand within existing communities and existing programs, um, and to expand our geographic reach by investing in new communities and new programs. So to date, more than $12 million of our annual budget have been granted to existing communities based on approved implementation plans. The current grantees were strongly uh, encouraged to consider adding 
new services or to focus on new special populations within their communities as identified by their local needs assessment um, and to improve or increase outreach efforts or um, innovative partnerships that align with the direction and new outcomes of Senate Bill 24. So that bill that sort of outlined our both our transition and some new outcomes um, and goals for the work under the new Family Support Services Division. Um, grantees have rose to the call for sure and propose to incorporate a lot of really exciting and innovative approaches and partnerships. And I just wanna highlight that some examples of those local innovations include new streamlined or formalized partnerships with WIC, with pregnancy resource centers, hospitals, and local clinics or other primary care healthcare settings, professional development for staff or for communities, expanding the capacity of existing programs to serve additional populations, including teen parents, parents in rural or other other served communities, fathers and military families, an increase in basic needs or concrete needs support, an increase in financial literacy and self-sufficiency approaches, including partnerships with local workforce boards, um, and enhanced programming with additional supports like case management or program navigation or peer navigation at the local level. So, um, so we're we're extremely excited about that expansion through um, investments with existing grantees. And I also just want to highlight that there have been two requests for proposals or requests for applications rather released to meet the growth of early childhood as guided by that new funding for new communities. The Texas home visiting request for application deadline has passed and our review and evaluation teams are currently working on that evaluation scoring and formalizing of recommendations. The healthy outcomes through prevention and support RFA was released just this week and the information and RFA documents are all available on the hhs.texas.gov website. Um, this is the program that focuses on providing local supports for children zero to five, and the specific eligible counties and communities are all listed in the RFA documentation on the website. And the deadline for those applications is March 5th. So I think that is my update. Happy to take any questions. Council members, questions. Stephanie? I have a question. Hello, Sarah. Um, one question is, I, I remember from SB 24 that there is a requirement of a strategic planning process that's going to happen for the new division or whatever we're, we're calling that um, in 2024, 2025. I think, could you give folks an update on what that timing is? And if that's begun, I just... I want to say it's got to be finished by September 2025, but there will be opportunities through that for input. Does that sound right? Yep, that sounds okay. right. <laughs> okay. And that's sort of what I would have said is that the, okay. the timeline for that is quite far in the future. And so I know planning is underway right now, both to identify what the process is going to be and where specific um, points of feedback will be. And uh, for sure, there will be information shared back with the council um, and in, in public forums around how to provide information, how to provide feedback into that process. Great. Thank you. All right. I'll just say congratulations on your dashboard being green. That's got to feel good. It's greenish. But but green enough that we're all pretty excited <laughs> yeah. about it. Um, and yeah. and I think um, what has been exciting is that in places where there has been any risk or uncertainty, I think there's maybe three or four contingency plans in place. So so I think we all yeah. feel pretty confident that um, that we're moving forward as planned. Yeah. Well, congratulations. It's um it's a big Thank lift. You. Yes. Transition. <laughs> so congrats. Okay, any other questions or comments before we move to our last update? Okay, Texans Care for Children has an update. Stephanie, I don't know if you want to say anything before sure. Alec talks. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, talk to I'll you. introduce Alec. 
Um, well, first of all, I let me apologize. I was incorrect about the review of the plan. I see, you know, it was last year. It was November of last year. So I had a little brain brain fuzz and I apologize for suggesting that we did not see it and we did. Um, and, and I'm pretty sure probably everybody provided comments. So that was just my 2024 brain fuzz. And I appreciate uh, Megan's diplomatic you know, correction of me in a very nice way. So um, the UT team did great and provided everybody an opportunity just for the public out there. I, I take my comment back. Um, for um, Alec, um, well, it's great that we got to follow up from Megan's uh, conversation about ECI. So um, we have uh, partnered with HHSE, you know, for many, many years to uh, find out more from ECI providers, what their challenges are, um, what kind of support would be helpful, whether it's training or funding or other things. And HHSC has always, uh, you know, been very attentive to the kind of feedback that we help um, provide through our conversations with ECI providers. So this year, um, our senior health policy associate, Alec Mendoza, oversaw another round of uh, surveys to the ECI providers around the state. And Alec uh, leads our ECI and children's health work. So I wanted to give him an opportunity to share the results of the latest ECI provider survey. And um, we did share it with uh, Megan ahead of time uh, from HHSC. And we will be, you know, kind of publicly sharing the results with the council and others. It just got finished fairly recently. So Alec's going to give just a high level update. And uh, thank you, Alec. We appreciate your being here. Thank you all so much for inviting me. Super excited to join this great group and talk about some of the work that we do. Um, so thank you, Stephanie. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen as I have just a quick slideshow that I wanted to present um, with our ECI results. Perfect. Um, so as Stephanie mentioned, this is something that we have done in the past um, and something that we will continue to do um, to try to get a better sense of hearing from our programs, those who are providing uh, services directly to kids and hear about the issues and problems that they are currently facing um, to see and get better results and try to get policy and uh, funding passed for them. So um, we were able to get 37 out of 40 ECI programs to participate, um, a little over 90%, which we are very happy and proud of. Um, I think this really gives us a really great sample of who, um, what exactly issues that we are seeing and help us uh, see um, you know, those issues across the entire state, not kind of um, focus on one program or the other. Um, so I'll go ahead and talk about what directors kind of uh, faced uh, in this past fiscal year. Um, and so in terms of enrollment, um, this is something that we talk about constantly. Uh, providers are serving um, uh, kids who are enrolled over the uh, contract number that they are supposed to be serving. Um, so what this does is it really sometimes puts ECI providers in a really big bind as they are constantly having to serve more kids over this uh, enrollment number that they have in their contract, um, kind of sometimes leading them to serve more kids with less funding. Um, so as you can see, 94% of respondents in our survey um, stated that they enrolled above contract in fiscal year 23. Um, and out of those who mentioned that they did serve above contract, you can see that um, those programs on average um, had 11% more kids than they were contracted to enroll. Um, again, so at this point, this sometimes puts providers in a position where they're serving more kids than they originally expected, um, but with that same amount of funding um, that they were supposed to serve and have um, to serve those kids at that original number. So again, this sometimes puts providers in a position where they're serving kids um, they're serving more kids with uh, less funding. Um, service hours is a number that is in our state budget. That is a hour that providers are expected to serve um, kids for. And so only 19% of our programs who responded, seven out of 37 programs, reached that 2.7 uh, for average hours target. Um, and so again, this really 
uh, means that kids are not receiving the amount of hours that they should be, um, primarily due to, and what we'll talk about later, um, a lot of staffing issues that we're seeing among providers. And I know Megan had mentioned that earlier a little bit um, with personnel help. Um, and this is something that we are seeing constantly um, across providers all around the state, and we'll get more into here in a second. Um, so again, reaching uh, reasons for not reaching those target hours, we have staff shortages at 87.7 or at 87 uh, percent. We also have family cancellation. So I, I want to point out that this is kind of important too, because right, uh, life gets really hectic for a lot of people, and so those family cancellations happen quite a bit. But because of these staff shortages, um, when providers uh, have to have a family cancel on their appointments, um, because of those staff shortages, there are not enough appointments throughout the rest of the month for families to be able to reschedule those appointments. And so that's becomes really, really important because again, while these family cancellations happen, you know, people have conflicts that uh, arise that puts them in a position where they can't make their appointments. The fact that because of staff shortages, there aren't appointments later in the month to make up, again, really puts those kids behind in those service hours. Um, we also have high caseloads as another reason. Um, and then some other reasons here, client family illness. Um, a lot of our providers um, due to closures over the past decade or so now cover a large uh, coverage area, some uh, covering as many as 10 counties in our huge state. And so again, that kind of also puts providers in a bind at times. Um, and then we have staff illness and lack of funding as a couple of other reasons that were noted by providers for not reaching those target hours. Um, again, staffing is a really, really big issue. We saw that 84% of programs reported that they were understaffed in fiscal year 23, again, contributing to a lot of the problems that we just mentioned. Um, and that this is something that we are still seeing here in fiscal year 24, which we'll go over as well. For fiscal year 23 funding, um, 92% uh, reported that the fiscal year 23 ARPA funds were essential for being able to serve their caseload and uh, meet client needs. This is, um, as Stephanie mentioned, a point where we worked really closely with HHSC um, to ensure that these funds were distributed to um, providers. Um, there was kind of some issues with being able to get those funds distributed right away in fiscal year 22 um, when those ARPA funds became available um, through legislation both at the federal level and as well as uh, at the state level. Um, and so we worked very closely with HHSC to get these funds uh, distributed to providers um, in a way that, as you can see, reported to um, them being able to stay afloat as they go on through fiscal year 23. 70% um, of our providers reported that their funding uh, for fiscal year 23 was not sufficient to provide the full amount of services to all qualifying kids. As mentioned, a lot of times this is due to a higher enrollment than what was originally projected um, for them to serve. Um, and so when they are serving above that enrollment target, um, they have that same consistent money that they were supposed to be having um, for those uh, that original number. Um, again, so this puts them in a position where they are not um, being uh, funded sufficiently. Um, and then 25%, a fourth of our respondents uh, mentioned that they ended fiscal year 23 with a negative balance. So now we'll talk a little bit about fiscal year 24, um, what's to come. So that's the current fiscal year that we have right now. And um, this is something that we really focused on last session was getting additional funding um, for our ECI providers. Um, HHSC uh, amazingly asked um, for an exceptional item in, H in their LAR request uh, that got fully funded both by the Senate and the House, which we were very, very excited about and was very appreciative of them um, doing so. Um, and we were able to, um, as an organization and as a ECI Advocacy Coalition were able to get more um, additional funding for folks um, and for our providers through an amendment on the House floor by Representative Mihaela Plessa, who represents uh, uh, Collin County, and as well as uh, work from uh, Representative Jatan, who chaired Article 2, the Health and Human Services article um, in the House. And so um, that work, along with Senator Kokors and Senator Hoffman, we were able to get an additional uh, little over $6 million um, in funding for our ECI providers, which we were super happy about. Um, and I think led to a lot of um, great success that we'll see here. Um, but uh, um, as we'll also mention, uh, more needs to be done. So uh, for most programs, 92%, um, their contract enrollment targets increased from fiscal year 23 to 24. So as you can see, we are still on that path of increased enrollment um, in ECI uh, programs all across the state for our kids here in Texas. And two thirds of those respondents think that they will enroll above what their target average is for fiscal year 24, kind of staying consistent along the lines of serving more kids than what is originally 
in their uh, contract. Um, but thankfully, due to uh, HGSC and that additional funding that we saw, 92% uh, of our uh, pro programs who responded received uh, an increase in state contract funding for fiscal year 24, which is great. But as I mentioned, uh, many of those uh, folks mentioned that they uh, do feel that their contract funds are going to not be enough to serve the caseloads that they will be seeing walk through their doors at the amount of hours um, that is uh, in the state budget. Um, and so while we're super happy about this additional fund, we'll be constantly fighting for more funding at the state level um, to make sure that our ECI programs are in a place where they can adequately uh, be funded to serve the amount of caseloads that are walking through their doors every single day um, at the amount of hours that they need to be. Um, so some of our UCI providers uh, talked about what their new contract funds will be used for. And as you can see, the top two numbers there um, all have to do with staff. So hiring um, additional staff, as well as attracting and maintaining staff with higher pay incentives or benefits, staying along the line of, you know, staffing being a very, very important issue for our ECI providers. Um, 52% of our respondents said uh, that they will provide more service hours per child due to this additional funding. 48% um, said that they'd be able to serve more kids. And then down below, as you can see, um, staff training is a, is a big issue, um, as well as conducting more outreach and, and training in communities. So child find and, and working with our preschools um, to be able to have that transition process be a little bit more seamless. Um, again, staffing, I sound like a broken record, but that's something that we're really focusing on and, and what we're hearing a lot about um, from our providers. Um, close to 80% of programs plan to use fiscal year 24 funding increases that we were able to maintain um, or obtain, I'm sorry, to attract and uh, maintain staff. Um, however, 62% of our uh, responding programs mentioned that they do not fully expect to be uh, staffed in fiscal year 24. Um, so, Again, staffing is an issue that we'll continue to take a look at um, and keep working with our providers and HGC on. Um, and then here are some uh, current challenges that we kind of gave an open-end question to for providers to mention, um, some other challenges that they are, are facing, uh, vacancies and hiring, uh, inflation is uh, impacting us all across the state. Uh, we have you know staff turnover, staff training, um, quite a bit of these other uh, issues. And so, as you can see, um, a lot of these are consistent among different programs all around the state. Um, so it's not just a specific problem that a specific uh, program is facing. Um, and so we're hoping to kind of, you know, to continue to collect these as the year goes on and hear more about some of these issues and see um, what solutions are out there that we can take. Um, and then we always try to get our ECI programs involved. We know a lot of them, um, due to certain restrictions um, from the state level, are not able to, but we feel that there is an opportunity for them to be more informative um, to the legislature about the issues that they are facing. And so um, we were able to uh, uh, also survey some of these programs to see where they could help in this advocacy and, and appreciate everyone here, um, you know, with all the work that they do uh, for early learning. And um, this is kind of... Um, what we're super excited about to get more UCI programs involved. So that's all I have. Happy to answer any questions. Um, I will be sharing uh, this with uh, Megan to um, share and distribute to everyone uh, at the end of this meeting, but uh, happy to have any questions or answers. I was just going to add, Alec, that um, for folks, you know, that don't, aren't as familiar with how ECI is funded, you know, there's, Megan can correct me if I'm wrong, it's something like 10 funding sources, you know, help support ECI programs from federal to state to local to uh, families, uh, sometimes have a cost share and, you know, other funding sources. So when we're talking about the contracted amount, you know, the when programs, uh, you know, do have to have a contract with HHSC, there's this uh, a, a attempt to you know, accurately anticipate what enrollment will be based on the past and thoughts about the future. And so, you know, sometimes those are on target and sometimes, uh, as Alec is showing, you know, the the number of kids is going up. There was a dip during the pandemic. So some of that is our population growth and some of it is families, uh, you know, learning about the, the program through pediatricians or childcare or others. Um, and, the way that ECI works is if a family with an eligible child presents, the ECI provider, you know, is required to serve them. So that's, it's not, 
like some programs that say I'm full and turn you away. They have to figure out a way in their region to provide those services. So when we're thinking about serving more kids, contracted amount, you know, has a cap. Um, and of course, you know, health insurance, play, you know, plays into coverage too. Um, that does end up, uh, as we found from providers, leading to a like a per child spending amount that ends up going down the more enrollment goes up and the contract, you know, above a contract level. So we have all talked about uh, per child funding for child care, you know, for quality programs. This has been a discussion in the ECI community for a while. Like what's what's the right per child target? Um, and of course, every child is different and has different needs. And that's something that's complicated. But that is something that we, you know, in HHSC and partners have been talking about providing a little bit more color and nuance to what it means uh, to adequately fund an ECI program for the services that a particular child may need. So we're not, um, of course, just thinking about what a slot costs, but we wanna make sure that kids with, you know, very individual and unique needs get all the services um, that are required and that would help them succeed. And that can be kind of a complicated uh, uh, calculation to get to, but that's something where a number of us are working on during the interim so that appropriators have a better idea of what the goal should be for an adequately funded ECI system. Megan, maybe anything so. to add um, <laughs> in case, or maybe it just gives some more context to something Alec mentioned. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, you're, you're right. Like the, the, the financing for ECI is like so incredibly complicated, right? And, and it, I want to say we have like 16 or 17 funding sources. Don't don't quote me on that because I didn't pull up my cheat sheet to double check myself. It's definitely more than 10 or 11. Um, and um, it, it does look different in different parts of the state, right? The cost of providing services to a child in Midland is not the same as the cost of providing services to a child in, in Dallas, even if they're getting you know, the same number of speech therapy visits per month, for example, right? It's going to be different. So we are preparing, uh, and I'll share more information when, when um, I have dates and links and things like that, but we're, we are going to be preparing a request for information to, to get at, um, try to get some more information on that specific piece of like, what is the true cost of, of serving? Like, what is the right target average out, right? Cost per child. Um, a couple of things that I just wanted to note, I think one of the challenges that, that we face as the, at an agency, and I think the larger community do too, is like we're, we're in this point right now, coming in the end of FY23 and coming into FY24, things have really stabilized in terms of our enrollment growth, right? We had this huge dip in the pandemic in 2020, followed by this really, really steep increases over 20, um, FY21, 22. And then in 23, things kind of leveled off kind of got through that backlog and things have kind of stabilized in terms of our growth. So um, we, I, I'm not surprised. It is true that in FY23, we had the vast majority of our local programs were over their contract targets. Our contract targets are based on what's in the General Appropriations Act, which is, you know, was set um, during FY21 or FY23, right? And so that was a really hard to predict time, right? It's really hard to go back there and see what will, like we, we did not predict that level of, of really stark increase in our, popula in our population. Um, and I was really pleased to, to hear in the survey that the, the, that the providers felt that the ARPA funding, and I think also probably the preschool development grant funding, like that mm -hmm. infusion of one-time funding that we were able to push out in the second half of the last fiscal year in FY23, you can see that in our data. You can see that our, um, at service hours went up a little bit. You can see that those things are kind of stabilizing too. So I'm really um, heartened going into this year and some of the data we've seen so far that we are starting to see that. Um, and then you also mentioned the legislative funding increase and the funding of our exceptional item request, right? So that means that um, the caseload that we're seeing that we had forecast for this fiscal year that we were funded out for this fiscal year is aligning with what we actually see. So I, it, it is always a little hard to predict because we allocate that out among our different, our 40 local programs. We do have a few that are over target. We have some that are close to, we have some that are under. Um, we did get some additional funding through preschool development grant for comprehensive services, which can be used for staff salaries, for example. 
Um, and we will be uh, looking at who is over their contract when we start looking at how to divvy that money up among our programs who want to participate. Um, and then the, we also doubled our um, funding through preschool development grant for this recruitment and retention specific piece. So we had $400,000 in calendar year 23, and now we have $800,000 in calendar year 24 specifically for that. So while the, the comprehensive services, they can use that to pay general salaries, you know, those recruitment and retention stipends, we doubled our funding for that going into this year. That's so great. I think we have a lot going on to, to hit at some of those things. And I really appreciate um, the, the data collection that you all do and the analysis that you provide. It's really helpful. Um, I think you obviously, you know, it, you by nature of your organization have a different relationship with the providers than we do. We all have the same goals, but they may talk to you a little differently than they talk to me. And so I really appreciate our relationship to, to gather and share that information so that we can um, tackle these really kind of weedy problems together. Yeah, the other thing, it's just a reminder because it's in our preschool development grant, uh, you know, our, our strategic plan is that the workforce challenges across all our early learning programs, um, and not just in rural areas, but in urban areas too. And in ECI, some of the folks who are needed really are specialists. They have to be OT, you know, physical therapy, speech therapy, others, and those are really in demand at the private sector and in the public sector. Um, and so that's also part of the challenge. I, I don't know how, if any of you have tried to get those services for your children or grandchildren, like there's, eight month waiting lists to see an OT person, uh, you know, someone who, who uh, so it's, you know, ECI is struggling just as home visiting, just as childcare and just as other programs are. And that's just, uh, so this survey is a good reminder of that. Kathy, you've had your hand up. Do you have a question or comment? Thanks. Yes, I have three questions. Hopefully I can remember them. I think I can remember two. Um, so thank you for the survey data, Alec, because it was um, very helpful for me personally. So this is a little bit self-serving, but I had a couple of questions relevant to what I do. Number one, and either Megan or Alec can answer. I'm curious if the data um, show when they anticipate an increase in enrollment in 24, even 2024, do they say which category out of curiosity? Like I'm curious if mental health category is where you're seeing the biggest rise even after COVID, right? So now 23, 24, and I don't know if you have that data. I, we didn't collect that entirely. Kathy, that's a great point. And actually something that we may want to consider looking at, especially because, you know, as most of these kids walk through their doors, it probably would be a lot helpful too. And I'm sure the programs have this, we just didn't ask for it. Of those, like where those specific kids are going to in terms of uh, services needed. So um, I'm not sure if, if Megan has that. Um, unfortunately, we don't, but um, I think that's something that we can maybe include in the future to get a better sense of uh, what kids need. Uh, when, when we look at um, the referral and the eligibility data, um, like when we look at referrals, we're looking at, okay, is it coming from a medical provider? Is it coming from... Um, social services, or is it coming from the family? Those are kind of our broad categories. Um, and then when we look at the eligibility, um, again, very broad categories, like we, uh, the vast majority of children who come into ECI are eligible based on having a qualifying development. I don't, in that data, have the ability to, to kind of go in really granularly and say, and this was a social emotional delay, and this is how many have a gross motor delay, right? Um, it's, it's a, very intensive process to get to that level of detail. Um, and I just don't have that, um, especially for our most recent data. Um, we do look at kind of like what the service array is and like how much, how, how many speech therapy hours or, or OT and PT, but it's really kind of more on those uh, core therapy hours. Um, we, we don't look um, as much at like counseling services, for example. One, one, the only thing I would add to that, Megan, is, and maybe this um, is relevant, it's a great question, Kathy, is um, there has been a trend, and hopefully, I know HHSC is working with programs to reduce this, where kids were coming in later to ECI than ideally we would like, you know, they may mm -hmm. not be getting identified and referred at, mm -hmm. at, at, you know, baby, you know, or age one, but are ending up at age two, and of course, they don't get services for too long. And at some point, you know, those needs may be higher than had they started um, 
younger. So I think there may be a kind of a cost and uh, duration and, you know, depth of need that may be affected by that, by entry into ECI. Um, and I think that was particularly you know, the case, you know, coming out of the pandemic with some of that back that referral backlog we had as kids weren't in child care, they weren't getting their well child visits. So they weren't as able to get those concerns identified and get to um, get referred over. Um, I do know that when I look at our our referral data um, for the most recent year, our um, it's a pretty even breakdown between how many infants, how many one-year-olds, and how many two-year-olds are getting referred and, and who are currently enrolled. Thank you. Um, my second question is the advocacy piece. Um, so um, our students are required as part of uh, their professional development in the NACI Standard 6 to advocate, to write a letter. And so this is a great opportunity for them to do so. So Megan, if you don't mind, I might contact you and, and Alec, are you going to make that information or is that information already available to us? Because I like to have students refer to evidence-based information when they're writing to a legislate legislature um legislator um do, are we do we have privy to that uh i we can definitely include you we try to make a toolkit to make it as easy as possible um especially for our providers and directors we know that they have a lot on their plate so when they do have a chance to um, advocate at the state level we we have a, a toolkit in place for to help them do so so happy to um connect with you Catherine, and we can go over that and um, okay, see great. what we can Connecting. And they'll also be, Alec will turn this uh, survey into, you know, a blog that links to the slides that also help explain and, you know, things that, uh, you know, people can do, which is just talk to legislators, right, about what ECI is and how important it is. It's not, it's not a lobbying conversation. It's just an educational, informative conversation. And Alec is also working with ECI providers, just like, you know, folks who are working with childcare and others to try to get policymakers in for a visit or go on a home, uh, go on a home visit and see what that looks like. My last question had to do with um, qualifications for staff, um, but probably I can get that off of your website, Megan. Obviously, there's certain degrees that require masters, but, um, you know, I think Becky can um, attest to this, that we are always trying to encourage students who go on for their bachelor's degree to look beyond childcare and preschool. And yeah, June can relate to this as well. So I can, I'm sure I can get that off your website. So um, I will look there, but I'm just kind of curious about what an intake team, for example, what are the requirements for that? Thank you. Thank you. Council members, any other questions, comments, observations? Clearly staffing is an issue that early childhood is facing across the board. Alec, thank that's that was a great presentation, great discussion. Mm -hmm. We you, appreciate Alec. it. Thank you, everyone. Okay, that is our um, our last update from council members. Our next agenda item are um, upcoming early childhood events, and we had one update from Kim Coffrin. Hey, everybody. Uh, good to be with you. And yeah, Alex, thanks for the great report. Um, we have an upcoming Early Childhood Education Summit, May 16th. Um, so stay tuned for more information on that. That's our big, uh, we do this annually, two hour big panels, try to bring in people from across the state and across the country to talk about early childhood. So stay tuned on that one. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it for now. All right. Um, council members, does anybody else have events that they didn't get to us in advance, but they want to mention now? All right. That is our last agenda item. Um, I didn't hear that any other council members had anything that they needed to bring up. So. Can I mention just one little thing? Sorry. Yes. Yes. Um, definitely. And that is, and you probably saw in the news that uh, the 12 months extension uh, postpartum coverage for um, moms in Medicaid uh, mm -hmm. was, uh, will go into effect March 1st. The HHSC's um, state plan amendment was approved by the Biden administration just this week or last week. Um, and so that uh, is very exciting and that that will go into effect on March 1st. And so there's uh, 
a great amount of work happening at HHSE to be ready for that. And we really appreciate their uh, work putting together a state plan amendment uh, application very quickly, and then that uh, getting approved. All right, thank you. Good update. All right, then that takes us to the end of our meeting. As a reminder, our next meeting is April 5th. So mark your calendars and look for a, a meeting invitation. Um, and with that, it is 1225 and um, we're going to conclude the Texas Early Learning Council meeting and adjourn. Thanks to all of you again.